Welcome to Hidden Conversations. Hidden Conversations is coordinated by WVIK and hosted by Dr. Ladrina Dr. Wilson, Ladrino. a leadership and diversity expert and founder of Iman Consulting. These conversations are designed to delve into many of the most difficult issues of race and equity facing the Quad Cities today. Many of these issues we hear about every day on the national news, but then are left unaware when they occur to our own friends and neighbors. We hope that by hearing first-hand stories and statistics from experts based right here in the Quad Cities, we can break down the myth that these things only happen somewhere else, and in so doing, increase our empathy for those who literally live right next door. Thank you for joining us this evening. Here's Dr. Ladrina Wilson. Good evening. I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to be with you all for another evening of Hidden Conversations. Our schedules have been thrown off a little bit. We typically come to you um, the second Thursday of every month, but it's summertime and folks have had vacations. And so I appreciate um, you guys tuning in when you can and being flexible uh, with us, but we should be getting back on schedule uh, here in September. So today's topic uh, that we bring to you today um, is one that I am really eager to dig into. So we're talking a little bit about intersectionality. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it's uh, looking at the various uh, multiplicities of identities that people have. And we're looking at the intersectionality of an individual's blackness and their uh, sexual or gender identity. Um, and so we've got some fantastic folks who are going to chat with us tonight um, to kind of share what their experiences are to help us better learn about the LGBTQ plus experience here in the Quad Cities. Uh, but before we bring in the guests, I just want to talk you through a scenario that I experienced a number of years ago. Oh, gosh, this was probably in 2011 or 12, maybe even 13. I was working on my master's degree and um, attended a, a local university. And one of the classes that I was in was a multiculturalism class. And as part of that class, the instructor, each week we had a, a particular um, ethnic group, minority group that we were educated on. And as part of that experience, we went to a local um, Orthodox church and to learn about a particular culture. And um, we got to meet with the, the uh, pastor from that particular church. And um, it actually turned into a little bit of a, a, a service, actually, which is fine. I'm very much open to learning about different people's face and how they um, experience their, their spirituality or religious identity. Um, but, but early in the conversation, it, it quickly turned um, to what I'll refer to as um, othering or even uh, prejudice, um, the, the pastor began to speak about um, members of the gay community in such a way that you could see that people's body language started to change, people shifting in their chairs and they couldn't sit still and um, people were just visibly uncomfortable. Um, and I've been in my own church uh, services before where that has happened, where in fact people have walked out. Um, but I thought, you know, What's happening here with this class that is having this learning opportunity, we've got someone who's not from that community, that LGBTQ community, um, telling us about that community. And as we were all sitting there as, as future, current and future educators, we sat there and we listened uh, to some of the disparaging remarks that were made about this particular population. And what stood out to me the most was there was one gentleman in the class who hadn't outwardly identified um, as gay, but I'd, you know, I'd seen him with his partner and that type of thing. But what I most distinctively remember is that not one of us spoke up. And I also remember going home that night feeling um, a certain degree of like unrest, uh, feeling um, disappointed in myself for not being um, not feeling comfortable being able to be an ally, not feeling like I had the language or the courage, quite frankly, to speak up um, in a manner that would um, at least let people, people from that community feel like they had dignity and that they were loved and valued. And what I also remember when I got home, I talked to my husband about what happened and kind of decompressed with him. And then, of course, we talked about it that following week in class and our instructor handled it um, brilliantly in class. Um, and I'm not sure what maybe could have been done different in the moment because we were in 
the the priest's house, so to speak, right? We were in their church. Um, so you want to show a certain level of respect to their beliefs, I guess. I'm still not exactly sure what we could have done differently. But what I do distinctively remember thinking is if I took out the word homosexual or I took out the word gay in every reference that that pastor made and inserted the word black, certainly someone would have stood up. And so as we talk about different identities that people have and we talk about the, the black experience, I'm also very cognizant of the fact that even within that black experience, there's still hierarchy. And again, I'm not here to play the oppression Olympics and say, you know, talk about who's got it worse or who's got uh, it better. But the reality of it is there are still marginalized communities within marginalized communities. And part of my responsibility um, as someone who wants to be an ally and who wants to be better about supporting other people and somebody who's committed to equity is creating a platform for, for power sharing. And so that's why we're here today um, in hidden conversations um, and, and exploring um, and get, creating a platform for members of the LGBTQ plus community as well as for those folks who want to be allies and, and as well as for people in this community to just better understand people who experience the world differently than them. And so this is, um, in some ways, my attempt to um, make right uh, what I didn't do right uh, years ago because I have uh, better knowledge, better courage, better um, sense um, to be able to um, bring my whole self to these types of conversations. Um, when other people aren't able to have the platform. So thank you for entertaining this. Thank you for jumping on and engaging. I do want you to encourage you to ask questions um, through Facebook. If you're on Facebook viewing this right now, ask questions throughout, especially if there's terminology that you're not familiar with or that you don't know what it means, jump in the comments. I'll be monitoring those. And if we can bring our guests in now, a few of my favorite people. And I'm, my kids will say that I say that I tell them all they're my favorite. And I probably say this with all of my guests, but like, y'all, these are some really dope people, okay? <laughs> and the conversation that we're gonna have today, I can tell you is gonna be second to none because we almost had the conversation just on the tech check. Like we do a, a technology just to make sure everything's working in advance of our show. And y'all, these folks were, were, were chatting. And, and educating and informing and um, and really bonding just even over our tech check. So with that, I'm gonna just do a brief introduction, but I'm gonna allow you guys to do a brief self <laughs> introduction. Um, and so we've got Brandy Donaldson here. She is an author, uh, communication specialist, um, very active and engaged in our community. We've got Jaron here today, an educator, uh, uh, an athlete. He might say a former athlete, but I'm gonna call him an athlete, a coach, um, and just a, a, a very positive energy. And we've got Tim here as well, who is a community activist, um, very involved in the community. You will see him at all types of things, uh, currently running for office as well um, here in Davenport, um, but just a, a very a forthright um, person who I've had in my life for a number of years who I admire for always saying what everybody else is thinking but won't say. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to, I'll start with you, Brandy, just because you're at the top of my screen here. Tell me a little bit about yourself and how you fit into this conversation around intersectionalities of identities. Sure. Thank you, Ladrina. I, I'm so um, thrilled that you're even having this conversation with us because um, Jaren and Tim and I, we all agree that we have not ever had this opportunity within the Black community unless we ourselves were facilitating the conversation for some reason. We've never really all have ever gotten the opportunity to speak on this um, from, from a place of our Blackness, as well as a place of, of our um, LGBTQ identity. Um, so for me, the way it, it fits for me, I'm a lesbian, out lesbian, out proud, um, masculine of center presenting, um, and I am obviously a woman and I am Black. Um, so all of those things intersect. I can't shed any of that on any given day. Um, I have to present all of that because it all comes in um, in, in the form of who I am. So um, that for me is is how it, it, it all intersects. And, and I did not grow up here in the Quad Cities. I actually grew up in rural Arkansas. Um, so that was an experience in and of itself growing up as a gay black person in, in that setting. 
Um, and then I moved to the Quad Cities when I was around 25. So I've been here um, about 15 years. Um, so I've had a, a breadth of experience also with that intersectionality here, right here in the Quad Cities. Okay. Okay. Now, Brandy, I'm going to, and, and all of y'all, I'm going to try to encourage you. I might ask you to like, kind of talk to me like I'm too. Some of the references that you make, I know I understand. Um, and some of them I may not, but I know that um, in the work that I do with my diversity consulting, I will say the LGBTQ uh, plus community is one where there's terminology that changes regularly and that people don't always um understand or know what the most current terminology is. And so it, it kind of almost keeps them out of the, the conversation because they're feel fear of failure, right? Like they don't want to say the wrong thing. So you said, um, sent, you said masculine, can you say it again in your own words and like describe sure. what it for listeners? Uh, yeah. And I'll preface by saying um, when you're nervous about terminology and you're nervous about labels, come from a place of respect. Right. And I know for me, when it comes to pronouns, when it comes to any label or terminology, LGBTQ plus, whatever, if it comes from a place of respect and you don't get it necessarily correct, I'm still OK with it if, if you're being respectful. Um, so, you know, I, I want people to know that they don't have to be afraid of the labels and afraid of the terminology. Just come from a place of respect and, and apply dignity to whomever you're speaking to. And you know, you'll be fine. But when I say masculine of center, masculinity is often um, associated with men, right? You know, men are the masculine sex, women are the feminine sex. That's pretty much, you know, our culture and how we think about masculinity and femininity. I am masculine presenting in the way that I dress, um, in the way that um, I present myself. However, I am, it has nothing to do with my gender. Um, I am not um, attempting to change my gender or to be uh, a man in the way that I present myself, but I am presenting myself with mas with a masculine um, a masculine uh, surface, so to speak. Okay, thank you very much, Jaron. You're up next. <clears throat> thank you. My name is Jaron Williams. My pronouns are he, him, his. I identify as gay, um, and like Brandy said. Ladrina, thank you for having this, put, giving us an opportunity to share our voices and tell our stories. I am from Rock Island. I grew up in Rock Island. So, um, and I like to say that I grew up in the 80s. So it was, it was hard to be gay because we didn't really see any positive role models of any hue who happened to be LGBTQ plus <clears throat> and out. So I, I, came out, like I've always known I was gay, but I didn't really come out till I was 20 and I was co in college and I went away to college. So um, I came out as a young adult and have lived most of my life as an out gay man. It's interesting being back in the Quad Cities because this was a hard place to grow up. And even though I love living here and love being back, it was, it was painful growing up. And certainly I didn't see as a teenager that I would be able to like live this life that I'm living. And when I say that, I'm just trying to be my most authentic, true self, because I think it's important for other people to see that since I didn't see that growing up. And I just want to share that it's interesting. I was thinking about this today. Um, you know, I, I see myself as a black man who happens to be gay, but I wonder if people from the outside looking in see me as some, some gay man who happens to be black. You know, it just, you're always thinking about that. And also, when I came out in the 90s, I thought that when you came out, you came out once. But I realized when I got into education that I had to not only come out more than once, um, but I also had to deal with some internalized homophobia that I had developed growing up just from messages that I had like heard directly and indirectly about what being gay was. So in trying to understand who I was and trying to accept and love myself, I really had to figure out what that meant because it was inconsistent with the messages that I was seeing growing up. And, you know, now that I'm back here, I was really nervous. I moved back to the Quad Cities in 2016. So I was 44 years old and I, I would still be a little bit nervous, even though I know the people who have known me for years have known that I'm gay. Um, but, you know, still not looking for acceptance, but trying to make sure that I could be myself in any space in which I walk. Yeah, 
I mean, I can I can definitely appreciate that and, and respect where you're coming from. You said a couple of things that really stood out to me. I'm just going to go with one of them because I know we want to circle back and get um, Tim in. But you talked about this kind of like, almost like a dichotomy of like, am I black in this space or gay in this space or am I gay in this space or am I black in this space? You know, like what's primary, at least from other people's perspective. And I, I share sometimes with people, um, I, I have that even in my in my womanhood, like where I've where I've had I've walked on an elevator before and a woman grabbed her purse. Well, it wasn't because I was a woman, right? Like she saw me as black and a threat. She didn't see me as a woman first. Right. Um, or I've been in spaces where um I, I won't share that story, but you know, where somebody decided like I was black or I was I was less of a woman or, or whatever. And it's just this weird thing that other people do when I when I walk into a space, I consider myself all of those things. Right. But the world around you doesn't. And then it dictates how they respond and react with you, engage with you. Exactly. And and to be short so that we can get to Tim, you know, it, it was exhausting. So I, I try to pride myself on not doing much of that anymore, not necessarily you know, being conscious, but being raised that way, just knowing that, you know, how the first impressions are everything and the way people see and perceive you. So I'm cognizant of that and try to put my best foot forward, but at the same time, not feel like I have to prove myself to anybody anymore. Like I deserve to be in a space. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, so we'll round it out. Tim, talk to us a little bit about how you fit into this conversation around intersexual or intersectionality. Well. Uh, thank you for having me this evening. One, I don't know how to follow those two acts because I feel exactly how Jaron feels. And then when you said what you said, so this is all new to me. So this is the first time I'm ever going to say this. I am a black gay male and I don't, I've never came out. I don't talk about it because um, usually I'm at the helm. I'm steering a conversation. I'm, I'm leading a training and you know you figure it out when i switch into the room with my merce you you know who i am you know what i'm saying and there's nothing to discuss so my struggles god this uh, a lot a lot because i'm black first because of the person grabbing grabbing your kids, locking your car doors. When I, and that's funny to me, because I'm just like this. And then when they see that switch, they're like, oh, he's soft, but don't let the softness fool you. <laughs> <laughs> but so. Tim, Tim, I know that people can't like see you and the people who know you know this, but you're like a tall, big dude. Like, so like to hear somebody, to hear that reaction that you're saying, somebody would say, oh, he's soft, like, that's just that's surprising to me because that's like the that's the farthest thing from my mind when I see you. Well, there you know, I, I'm I'm the first generation out of the South. So with that being said, it's typically I, I don't want to put but my mama's generation soft, sugar in the tank, uh what, what are come on now. Sissified. Yeah. You know, that's a, yeah. A, a shim, uh, you know, anything of that nature. You know, those are the things I grew up with and I heard, and it's just like, mm -hmm. oh my God. So you know, like So then you can just, you can you tell me if you're if you're comfortable? You know, you said you didn't obviously you don't have to talk about it because it was just understood. Um, but hearing those types of things, and probably anybody can contribute to this, but hearing those types of things, how does that shape your how you experience your identity? You know, how you determine if you come out or if or if you walk a certain way or if you carry yourself a certain way like when you hear those things how did that shape your outward display of who you are oh i tried but honey when it, it, it is what it is the purse falls out your mouth um you know <clears throat> i i don't know you know you because once again first generation out the south my mother's a preacher's kid um Jesus Christ, Lord, church in the morning, church in the afternoon, church in the evening, you know, church, 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 church. He just ain't found the right woman. She's out there, yada, yada, yada. Oh, okay. So, you know, um, it's been a long, hard struggle, but let me tell you, 
the pandemic took my father. It had me down for almost two months in the hospital. I'm unapologetically big, black, and homosexual, honey. Period. Dot. You know. I, so I, now I just have I've had to learn to curve the Samuel Jackson in me. I'm still there, <laughs> but I'm just saying I've had to learn because I'm not going to worry about how you feel or how you when you've offended me. Don't flip it back to me so as if I've offended you because of who I am and what I do. Because you ain't up in here. What we do in the streets is what we do in the streets. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's rough. Yes. Yeah. Well, I appreciate um, you all sharing sharing your your experiences as a form of you know informing other people because I realize there's a, a high degree of vulnerability that I'll never be able to understand that comes with that. Um, but certainly some of the things that we talked about was just, you know, trying in sharing, how can we make sure that the generation behind you, behind us, doesn't have some of those same experiences? Um, you know, we talked quite a bit about what it means uh, to have an equitable community or what it means to be able to be your full self, you know, in your walk in this space and in other spaces. But when we talk about those experiences, there's also, you know, the racial component. We, we don't hesitate to talk about the racial or ethnic, ethnic experiences. We don't hesitate to talk about how people who are impoverished maybe experience the world differently than people who come from means. And we very often don't talk about the sexual identity or the gender identities that people um, embody. And when you look at people's experience and you, look at, for example, race, and then you throw an element of, you know, whether you're gay or lesbian, transgender, uh, or anywhere um, on that spectrum, right? Um, it it becomes um, very clear that there's something that's happening there when you look at health outcomes, when you look at uh, particularly mental health, when you look at education gaps, when you look at uh, income and, and, and income gaps, right? Like, opportunities that people have or don't have, um, there's some disparities there that need to be dug into. And when we don't dig into that, like, and disaggregate those identities that people have, we are missing a whole nother piece. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I want, I, if you're willing to, you know, based on your knowledge and your experience, would you talk to me a little bit about your LGBTQ plus experience um, as a black person and how that's played out here in the Quad City? Uh, I'll go. I'll circle back to you, Brandy, because I know you've lived. I'll start with you because I know you've lived in other places. I don't know if you worked in those other places or if you primarily just worked here um, in your career. Uh, well, I started my career in uh, Southern Missouri. Um, went to school in Arkansas. Went to Southern Missouri. Came here. Um, I went through great lengths um, to hide my sexuality. Um, mm. I. Growing up, as Jaron mentioned, I knew what I was. I didn't know what it meant or how it would present itself in my life. You know, when I was a child, of course, how would I know that? But as I became an adult and I realized how hated people are who are gay, the horrible things I used to hear people say referring to gay people in their own families, referring to gay people in my family who, who were just suspected of being gay. No one was out. These are just people they expected, suspected of being gay. It was horrible. I never wanted to be subjected to that. And then the religious component, um, being <coughs> someone who was in a household where I would go into the religious organization and hear these same things perpetuated. They may not have called the names, the ugly names, but it was the perpetuation of you are wrong. This is a part of you that is horrible, that is detestable that should be put away or you're, or, or you're, you're, you're doomed to damnation. All of those things terrified me, Madrina. I mean, terrified me. And I knew what was going to happen once I let that part out of me. I knew I was gonna lose relationships and I did. I knew I was gonna be isolated from um, parts of my family and I was. I knew I was gonna be shamed. It, doesn't, it didn't matter anything else I was doing in the world. It didn't matter anything else about me. I knew that was gonna happen. And I knew there were gonna be people in my own community, black people, who were going to judge me solely on the facts that I was gay and nothing else, okay? So that terrified the, that scared the, I'm trying to hold my Samuel in too, Tim. That's, that scared <laughs> me. <laughs> that scared me, okay? That, to me, 
we're already discriminated against enough. So I thought, you know, because I could wear my hair a certain way and I could dress feminine and I could present myself that way. Even though I knew what the real me was, I could still present my outer self, you know, and, and, and hope that nobody knows. So I, I was like 25. I, well, I'll just say this. I never came out. I never did a big display. And I want people to understand how um, we love to, the Harvey Milks of the world, come out, come out of the closet, everybody come out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's dangerous sometimes to come out. Mm -hmm. It's traumatic, especially when you're black. Um, so it's, I'm not one of those people who ever gives that advice. Come out at any cost, tell everybody. No, that's dangerous, that's traumatic. Um, for me, I was an adult on my own, no longer dependent on my parents, no longer dependent on anybody until I had the courage to even start <coughs> saying it out loud. Now, when I went into the workforce here, when I came here, I was a news reporter. So I was <coughs> all over the place. You know, a lot of, I was always being seen. Again, I did not want people to know. I wasn't necessarily um, lying about it or hiding it, but I did not want people to know. So I still presented myself a certain way. I still wore my hair a certain way. I still dressed a lot differently than I dress now. Um, I, I still kept that disguise on so that it wasn't evident that I was there. Because it was still pretty scary to, to even th even though I was starting to come into my own, it was still scary for me to be, I didn't want to be known as that that black gay chick. That, that wasn't what I wanted to be known as. Now I actually like it. Now it actually kind of sets me apart from a lot of other people. And when I walk into the room, people, that's how usually how people remember me. Oh, you know, you know, Brandy, the, the, the gay one, the butch one, the, you know, whatever. But it, it's terrifying. It's terrifying when you're young and you're trying to navigate that. And then you come into adulthood and you think, oh, you know, I'm an adult now. It's just going to be so easy. No, it's, it's still, it's still terrifying. Even um, the way I look and, and the way I present myself, like Tim said, it's I, well, I get mistaken for a man all the time. I get called he, I get called sir, you know, and, and that aspect scares me of, you know, will I get that promotion? Will I get that job I really want? Um, I just made a comment to one of my vice presidents. I work in corporate America that I will no longer ever, ever, ever hide myself to advance. Um, I tried that, tried to do it, get the job. You're miserable because you're not presenting yourself. You get the promote, you, you know, and I told her, I said, I, I am to a point in my life now and I'm 39 years old, just now getting to this point that I will never hide any aspect of who I am. But out in the world, when, when we're talking about my people, black people, um, just just the world in general, it's still a scary place for gays. It's still a scary place and it's still a traumatic place for a lot of us, still a harmful place for a lot of us. You know, the experience you had in, in that church how many of us who are gay who've ever been in a church hasn't had that experience where you're just wanting to melt in your seat oh my gosh when that sermon starts and you're looking around like who's looking at me who's pointing to me you know and you don't even have the courage to get up and walk out because then you just right. <laughs> you just outed yourself so right. you just sit there and you melt in your seat but it's some of the most hurtful hurtful um experiences to go through so not to just ramble on and on but you know, I think Tim, Jaren, and I have probably all had that experience of, mm -hmm. you know, and, I and when I say it's scary, it's scary because you don't know where what that where that harm is going to come from, really, and you don't know exactly how it's going to present itself. Is it going to be physical? Is it going to be mental? Or sitting in those religious spaces, it's just that spiritual beating, um, you know, as if you know you're you're the devil himself, um, which is part of the reason I really took myself outside of religion. I, I don't, I don't prescribe to any organized religion and probably never will again in my life um, because of those experiences. So it's, it's, it stays with you and it is very much um, a reality for a lot mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in here? Yeah. I saw you kind of put your hand up. Well, let me thank you, Brandy, because I, I wasn't going to share, but I'm going to share this tidbit. When I was a child, um, I was so footloose and fancy free that, you know, I didn't know anything about homosexuality, this, that, and the third. So I was just doing me. So I used to do me to the point where when older black men, I, there's a kid that's from the Quad Cities that has a story and he used to put his stuff on the internet. I'm not going to say his name, but you know, 
he went through a lot of trauma and he dealt with it in a different way. I dealt with it that my mom and them sheltered us. So, you know, somebody would be like, hey, bitch. Who who they talking to? Or they would say stuff like, are you sucking dicks today? What? As a child, who, what? So I'm looking around like. You were a child with people saying that to you? Grown men, black men. So when Brandy's talking about the church, honey, I don't look around to see who's, because I'm looking at all them going, mm. I know they ain't looking over here because looking over there, look over there, look, because honey, I'll point you out now because I, and I really wouldn't, but I'm just saying it's funny to me how the ones that are the rudest and the most, Hatefulest and the ones that get in your face is the ones that's trying to hide and dig holes and go the opposite direction. Mm. They just as gay as you are. Mm. So, mm. honey, when I tell you, I just sit there and go like, mm, mm. "Y'all don't want this. Ain't what you want." That's a whole different kind of trauma. This ain't what you want because I've I've ran and I've hid, and I'm not. Oh, and this is another thing I wanted to say when you're talking. It wasn't a conversation. I wasn't trying to have this conversation. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't running, but. It's like, oh, you're going to be my new gay best friend. And I look at it and be like, what are you talking about? Because that wasn't up for discussion because I hadn't come into my own. So therefore, how are you going to make me come into my own so I can be your new gay best friend? No, that ain't how that works. That's not how that works. So I double back and I'll be done. As, as a child, men, I will tell y'all offline, y'all know who I'm talking about, the young man that had he moved away because he told all on all these he's like you ladies is mad at me be mad at your man he's from rock island he told on all them men that messed with him as a kid i never really forced it i had people that did stuff to me but i didn't have a laundry list of people like this young man did so but i'm just saying there's a lot of folks black here in the quad cities that would rather put you down and stomp you down knowing what they're trying to go out there and go get does that make sense Oh, absolutely. And, okay. I, and that's I, a whole other form of sexual abuse that happens within our community as well. That the converse, I mean, when we, we said these are hidden conversations, right? So here we are. Um, that that, that tr triggers some things in me because that's a whole other part of this hidden conversation that needs to come out of the closet, so to speak. The sexual abuse that occurs mm -hmm. to young people who, mm -hmm. who or even, like you said, Tim, you never had to tell and say, oh, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. But people coming up to you, propositioning you, grown men, and these things happen. And that's why our community is the most devastated by AIDS and HIV. Mm -hmm. Because we, ha well, and, and we're not talking about this enough. We're, we're not talking we're about talk it enough. We're not talking about it at all, honey. What we're talking about is um, what I've heard other people refer to as um, men who sleep with men, but they don't identify as gay. Sure. Yes. Or, and there are you know, women so who sleep with women that don't identify as gay as well. Same, Same but I think in this context is what, you know, following off of what Tim is describing, I guess is what I'm getting at is if we don't call, if we don't have these types of conversations, that's how we end up in some of the situations we're yes. in because like owning your identity, understanding what comes with that, understanding how to be responsible in that identity too, right? Um, can can have a huge impact on some of the disparities that we're experiencing as it relates yes. to HIV. Right. And it's dangerous, Ladrina. It's dangerous. Um, if you are a young gay person and you are not taught about your healthy sexual relationships and the fact that you're, even though you're a gay young man, you shouldn't be having sex with grown men. Right. If, you know, if you're a child, you right. should not be allowing yourself to be propositioned in a certain way just because you are gay. Again, if these conversations aren't had with our young people and we're not taught healthy, no matter what your sexual identity is, you should still be taught about healthy relationships, healthy ways to use your body, um, what abuse is and what abuse constitutes. And we refuse to have these conversations when it comes to our LGBTQ plus individuals. We keep this conversation over in, in a vacuum, but it's dangerous and it, and it does cause so much trauma within our LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. community. There's so much abuse. There's so, so much um, molestation that's rampant and things. Like that. <laughs> and we're not talking about it enough because we, we want we want to pretend that it's not happening because it's being perpetuated by those outside of LGBT 
club. Like you said, men who sleep with men, but don't dare call them gay. Women who sleep with women don't dare call them gay. And there's some unhealthy, you know, things that happen, you know, based, right. based on those attitudes. And again, we could talk for eight hours just about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, Very hidden, but it's, it's costing us lives and it's detrimental. Very detrimental. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Now, Jaren, you you're from the Quad Cities um, Mm -hmm. in terms of where you were born and raised. And you said you, you know, had your coming out experience in college. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, your experience um, as a gay man here in the Quad Cities, either in your youth or, you know, at present, however you want to situate that is up to you. Well, since you present it that way, I'm going to talk about it both ways. So um, growing up, I would say that you know, a, a large part of my identity was being an athlete. And so I was involved in track teams and growing up at junior high, high school level, I was fortunate enough to run in college, but that didn't appear to be my future until late into high school. And so I've always known that I was gay. So it's one of those things where obviously you're not talking about it and you're sharing a locker room space with other males and you can't be yourself and you can't confide in any of them because you know all youth are like trying to figure out who they are. So then to add that layer of, hey, I'm gay, and have somebody accidentally take that as, oh, I'm telling you that because I'm coming on to you. Um, mm. you know, so so really, it's, it's crazy because I'm a really social person, but growing up, I always felt like I could be in the most crowded locker room and I was the only person there. I felt so alone and isolated because I, I feared rejection. You know, I, I want to be part of the team and want to prove that I'm a a part of the team, a valuable part of the team. At the same time, I don't want to deal with others. So, you know, it was, it was very, it, it led to a lot of depression. So that, and then my experience with church is a little different, but the messages I was getting from church caused me not to go to church, even though I know there are open-minded churches like the MCC now, but no, I, you know, I was suicidal as a result of the fact that I was going to hell because I was gay and I wasn't even sexually active. So um, thank goodness I was part of teams that were successful and most of my teammates were young men that I grew up with. So even though I didn't feel like I could confide in them at the time, um, you know, they provided me the kind of support, I guess, that all young people provide, especially when you're working toward a, toward a goal. Um, when I went away to college, it was even harder um, because, you know, now people are, I went to a state school, division one school, and people were sexually active and it was relatively obvious so now i'm even more alone because i'm not having sex i can't tell my teammates <laughs> that i'm gay because i don't want them thinking i'm coming on to them and it, so it's just this whole awkward dynamic and um it's very it's crazy because i mean we're not talking about bad people i don't think they're bad people but i i really felt alone like i didn't have any any friends on the team luckily for me that i had friends outside that i could finally confide in and and that really helped me and, it, and that was really big in terms of like realizing that I wasn't this bad person, um, that I was hearing all these messages, you know, gay people are bad and all these other things. And um, just realizing that, wow, there are people who, it has nothing to do with my sexuality, like because of my personality or whoever I am as a person, they accept me and I happen to be gay, but they are not uncomfortable about that. They don't shy away from that. And that saved my life. So, you know, even then when I was able to come out, and kind of get into my young adulthood. I just, I still never saw myself being an educator or a coach and, you know, getting to that place. It's like, you know, this is kind of important work. Like, I don't want to be up on a soapbox. I'm not necessarily trying to be anybody's hero, but, you know, I think that life would have felt easier if I had a coach or a teammate or somebody who was out or I knew that seeing them, it would be okay to be myself. Because being gay didn't stop me from wanting to be the best person on the starting line. You know, they didn't impact my goals that way. But when people don't know those things, like gay for them is like, oh, you want me and you're going to make me uncomfortable. And I'm generalizing. I get that. But, you know, I've had this conversation with my teammates who were all adults now. And many of them are still my friends, which are great. But, you know, I'm like, you know, we couldn't have that conversation when we were 16, 17 or 18 years old. You say what you want about knowing that I was gay, but there's no way I could have said to you that I was gay and you would have been okay with that. Like, I just don't believe that. Um, The Quad Cities certainly at the time didn't feel open-minded like that. So there was no way I was gonna be anything other than like this kind of buttoned down athlete. And I'm part of a team who's trying to find success and any 
sliver of personality, I'm going to have to contain that if I can, mm -hmm. which is hard. And like I said earlier, exhausting. So mm -hmm. you know, when I got into coaching um, and I was able to start like dealing with like the layers of internalized homophobia, you know, I just feel like if, and, and this sounds hokey, I know, but if I'm out living my best life, regardless of my kid's sexuality, um, hopefully they feel like they can go out and live their best life, let best life and be themselves. And, you know, it, I feel like, uh, you know, in that sense, I'm, I'm real fortunate because a lot of the parents since I've been coaching have always been super supportive and which is always bog boggling my mind. Cause it's like, you know, my son doesn't stop talking about you because of your personality. Right. And I'm just like, really, I don't get it. Cause I just, I'm going out being myself and, you know, I'm not trying to be anybody's hero, but it is really cool. But you're dope. I it told you, like, you're you're dope. Yeah. <laughs> so I can see why. Well, <laughs> no, really, you yeah, like yeah. really. Each of you is so yeah. unique in my inter interactions yeah. and engagements with you, but you have such vibrant energy, right? Yeah. And so, like, as I'm listening to you, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but like, I just, okay. it's it it is it blows my mind, Jaren, because like I've only known you gay, right? So yep. to to have any other version of you that would be this like shell of yourself right like i just can't even imagine what that would be like because you're this phenomenal human being that i know right that's and very so, nice to say thank you it, it, and i think that makes a good point ladrina yeah. we all just want to be known for our humanness right yep. you know yeah. I, I don't want to speak for jaren and, and tim but i bet i'm right when i say jaren doesn't want to be known as the gay coach right. or the, the gay teacher you know tim doesn't want to be known as the gay alderman or the, the gay community organized. I don't want to be known as the gay whatever. Right. I would like to be known for my humanness, yeah. uh, what Martin Luther King called the content of our character. Right. Because before <laughs> we're anything else, we're human beings. Right. But when you're gay, and especially the intersectionality of being black and gay, it, that's everyone leads with that. Mm -hmm. As if that's the only aspect of you that matters, or the only aspect of you that you want anyone to see. Even if you're very, very um, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm a masculine person, but I still, I'm not, I don't want to walk into a room and be the gay person. Right. You know, I, there are instances where I am very much pro-gay because maybe I'm, I'm working on a cause or maybe I'm doing advocacy work or maybe there's a reason why I want to step up on my gay. So right. Right. however, in my day-to-day -day life, just hanging out, being who I am, in my workplace, in the Quad Cities, I don't want to be no just be known because right. I'm the gay the, the gay black chick. You right. know, that's that's not our identity, our, our full identity. We're human right. beings. Well, you know, Brandon, so I, and, I'll say, and so when Ladrina met me when she was in high school, you know, I I was out, but I think you know she knew I was really passionate about track, so we could talk about track, and yeah. she she knows I could appreciate what marks she was achieving in competitions. I will say though, like you, Brandy, I have embraced knowing that you're going to notice me when I walk into a space. Mm -hmm. So I usually have on something athletic, and that's what I love about being at this stage in my life. You know, um, not necessarily again trying to be on a soapbox, but just being who I am and, and loving sports. So you know, a lot of my students and the kids I coach they see I, i'll have on some athletic and i have a rainbow on it and i'm not ashamed in that sense so if i'm going to mm -hmm. be the gay black coach you are going to see me but again you're going to see me and it's going to be i want you to be okay you know and, mm -hmm. and whatever that means so it's not that i'm coming out and i'm using the words to make sure hey this is our first day i'm your coach and i'm gay but i'm like see this and see me comfortable in my skin and i'm still going to try to help you achieve those goals that you have for yourself and i'm still competitive in that sense so i'm not, you know i'm not a babysitter you know i'm out here pushing these kids and trying to be better, you know, and just because I had coaches who did that for me. So help me realize and achieve goals that I didn't realize were possible for myself, um, being able to share that experience with kids and help them. And again, be visible. So if, you know, they're feeling like I can't be myself or if I'm myself, I'm going to feel alone and not a part of a team. I hope no kid ever feels like that. Like I wouldn't wish that I wouldn't wish that on a bully. I wouldn't wish that on an enemy. It's not a but I think theory. I think it goes and I don't want to hijack your experience, but I think it is applicable to um, a lot of different identities. Right. Like if you're able to be comfortable in your own skin, like, you know, we've had silly conversations where I spent a number of years in, in my work environment wearing my hair a certain way because I thought I had to. Right. 
But if I can see somebody as a kid, right? If I if I can see somebody as a kid be exactly who they are, mm-hmm. that's one less barrier that that person has in terms of right. how are people going to receive me if I have my natural hair out, which is silly, but it is something that we we have to worry about because dreadlocks has a connotation or natural hair has an ungroomed look to people who don't understand it, right? And so it is about your identity, your sexual identity or your gender identity, but it's more than that too, right? It's that and something else. And I think the other really important piece, I'm getting all worked up, you see my hands going in the air. (laughs) I'm like, oh yeah. So um, I think the other really important piece is like, I hear going back to the, the title of our show is Hidden Conversations. When I tell you in my time as a person who is not, uh, you know, part of the LGBTQ plus community, I know what I hear about people who are. And yeah. when I do hear about it, if people are willing to talk about it, it usually is a negative. OK. And so then now I think we've moved into another phase. Right. Where because people are more open with their identities, uh, maybe even in subtle ways with a little rainbow on something or whatever the case may be, you have people who are making comments that are still negative, but they're a little bit softer. So it's like, why are you trying to force that on us? Why are you trying to, and, and it's like, first of all, if me and my husband do a public display of affection, you don't consider that us forcing it on you. Okay. You considered it the norm, mm-hmm. right? There's right. that, but then there's also this component that's like, when people have, when you've lived it and you've walked it and you've had to shelter in place in your own skin, mm-hmm. why would you ever want somebody else to experience that? So mm-hmm. when you see somebody who has a rainbow or who has your shirt on, which I can't see the bottom of it. <laughs> it says, yes, they're gay people in the Midwest. When you <laughs> see that, <laughs> it's not necessarily about you. In my mind, it's not about you forcing your identity on me as much as it is creating a space where people can be exactly who they are, no matter what, no matter where they are. Or they're just living their life. Right. They're just living their life. And, and for, for me, I think about what James Baldwin says about, um, uh, about prejudice and the fact if we didn't have hate in the world, (laughs) people would then have to deal with their own pain. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you couldn't, then, if you couldn't project hate onto someone else or another group of people, you would have to then deal with yourself. And most of us don't want to deal with ourselves. No. Because the people that hate us or hate me because I'm gay, it has nothing to do with me, really. It's all about their internal struggle <coughs> within themselves. They they have pain that they're projecting and leaning on to me. And the the issue is that it's made very easy by some institutions like religious groups who will still preach that rhetoric of, um, you know, if pastor says it and and the church says it, then I can go out the world and I can lean my hate onto that because it's just easy. You know, it's easier than admitting your own, you know, your own internal battle, your own internal pain, your own internal ignorance in, in many cases. And, you know, For a lot of us, we would rather, even though we're a part of a marginalized group already being black people, we're projecting more pain out to someone who's who we can at least say, well, at least I'm not that, you know. So Mm -hmm. for me, it's all about, you know, once you get rid of that hate and once you start stop being ignorant and stop being a bigot, you then have to probably deal with yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Can I say something real quick, too? You know, there's there's levels to it as well. So when you said you and your husband are out and you're showing affection, you're not pushing it on that. But when people see, Brandy, I hate to pick on you for, but when people see lesbians, they love that. They love it. Cause it's like, how can I get in? How can I turn her? But when they see two men, it's like, look at them fags. Well, if they see the nice little, little, you know, the pretty feminine. Well, well, you're right. So, <laughs> but there aren't there levels to it? There's levels to it's where they'll be levels. like, oh, levels. Maybe levels. That's, that's acceptable. I'll mm-hmm. sit there and watch those two ladies go. Well, that's cute. cute. You know, that's sexy. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? That's true. And we're also not a sideshow. We're, right. we're also not a sideshow. Hello. And we're not a fetish. Hello. Um, you know, uh, uh, what we find today in society, you know, this fetishism of the, the women and, you know, different, mm-hmm. different aspects of sexuality. Mm-hmm. Again, that's not what we're here for either. Mm-hmm. We're not entertainment. No. We're not, um, we're, and we're also, um, you know, I don't. I don't want to keep going back to the religious aspect of it, but you mm-hmm. know, there are so many things I imagine 
you could be talking about during a sermon um, as opposed to someone's sexual orientation. Um, if I think of all the things that I've ever read in the Bible, for example, that was, I don't remember ever seeing any emphasis put on, you know, there's like this one scripture here, this one scripture there. Isn't that what they did with slavery? They took one scripture out of the Bible and they said, hey, we justify this, this because of this one passage. So I always, I, and, I, and I say this to my people who like to use the term ally a lot. And I know the religious organizations is the hardest place to be an ally because most people won't speak up. Mm -mm. If that's what they're hearing the pastor talk about, and if that's what's being preached, it doesn't matter if they're be if I'm their best friend, they're not gonna speak up. It, it doesn't matter if a lot of them, like Tim said, that themselves, they're doing exactly what gay people do, but they are still sitting there. And that's why I have such a hard time with the term ally, because a lot of people like to use that, because yeah, you may wear a, a rainbow shirt in the month of June, um, but, do you speak up when your pastor is right. saying those things? When your mother is saying those things, when your right. uncle is saying those things, do we, I'm not saying go, I, I'm not a big fan of outing people, but what Tim said, the young man did in Rock Island, kudos to him for, you know, blasting these people who are, who are out in our society doing these things that are detestable. Um, they did that but he had to leave town. He had yeah. to then leave town. Yeah. Because, <laughs> he couldn't yeah. stay. Mm. But kudos to him for having the courage to even um, do that. I wouldn't have had that courage um, to do that, even though I know a lot. Um, but it, it's when Tim said there's levels. Oh, my goodness. There's so many levels. Well, I mean, so it, it's no different than, you know, like I said in the opening, like the oppression Olympics. Right. Like I think a natural, unfortunately, a natural like element of our human experience is how we uh, the social human experience is othering. Right. Like we try to and, and, and how we find our in group is identifying who our out group members are. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. So even within the LGBTQ community. Right. There's going to be some othering that would happen because it's, it's part of this human social socialization. Right. And, and unless we are having deliberate conversations around or unless you are conscious of the fact that you're falling into those habits. Right. We, we don't create it. it I, I mean, I hate to say this, but it seems like inclusion is like not our natural inclination. You have to work at it. Right. You have to work at it because the way our brain works is to say who's who's like me, who's not like me. And then we create this hierarchy. Right. Even in even in the subtle, most subtle ways. Even um, within our even in, within our LGBTQ spaces, yes, yes. walking in and being black, you're not always accepted. You no. know, and I found that to be an issue locally, you know, in, in, to, in different spaces and different things that I would try to participate in. And it's like, oh, you're a black lesbian? Oh, no, thanks. <laughs> you know, we, we don't need you. <laughs> we don't need your help. <laughs> you know, we don't. So, you know, I, I ended up, you know, with friends of mine, like creating our own spaces and saying, you know mm -hmm. what? We're going to go. We're going to be a part of things, whether they want us or not. And then at some point it's like, oh, now we need you. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, OK. But and, and if you're talking about the alphas, I want to commend you because when mm -hmm. I said I have never had this. So the first people that have ever asked me to do something was Miss Shelley and T and the Alphas and now Madrina. I've never, ever been asked by the black community to do anything besides those three names that I just said. Yeah, and what Tim's referring to is is my friend T. LaShore and I about yeah. 10 years ago, maybe, yeah. maybe not quite 10 years. We created our own group and because we were trying to be a part of the LGBTQ community as black lesbians. And the Quad we in the yeah. Quad Cities. And we yeah. were being shunned, basically. Yeah. We were not, you know, we wanted to be on these different boards and a part of these different organizations. Mm -hmm. And they were looking at us like we had horns growing out of our head. And three titties. So, so yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> T and Samuel I have to Samuel L. Samuel L. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what he means. Yeah. You know, so T and I got together and we said, you know what, we'll create our own organization. And, and, and we I, called I, it African American it. Lesbian Professionals Having a Say. Because oh. we wanted to have a say. People, Maybe. they weren't listening to us. They weren't including us, even within our own LGBT. And obviously in the black community, we didn't have any space to be lesbians and to have a say. So we're like, we'll just create our own organization. And then we started doing things around town. It's like, oh, we need you, Alphas. We need you over here. And it's like, oh, okay, now you need us. After we had to go out and create our own um, space in order to simply have a say in what was happening in our own communities. 
And so, so we, you, you know, we, when you said alpha, I thought of the fraternity. So I'm glad. No, 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 no. That's I'm why sorry. I never that. But she, she knew. Cause like I said, they reached out to me and I got to be on groundbreaking. And so I got to be at the beginning. So I, I, That's why I, I had to clear that up. I didn't want anybody to think. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. But it's African-American lesbian professionals having a say. And that's the acronym alphas. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, Hey guys, there's a question that actually came in, in the comments a while ago. It's directed at Jaren, but I'm going to, I'm going to remix the question. <laughs> okay. Missy. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm going to from a new man yet, okay? The question is about creating and promoting inclusive environments as a coach for young folks um, who are out questioning or firmly outside the LGBTQ uh, plus umbrella. So, Jaren, I'm going to give you that question directly, but then Tim and Brandy, I want you to think about the spaces that you occupy whether it's corporate environments or whether it's through activism, how do you create uh, inclusive environments uh, for people, for the, the communities identified? So Jaren, I'll let you answer, then I'll turn it over to you, Tim, and then uh, you, Brandy. For me, it, I guess it starts kind of with like the quiet um, inclusion, if you will. So, you know, wearing things that cl clearly mark me as gay identifying also for the past Four years, I've been involved with a LGBTQ plus um, sports group called Out Sports. So, you know, I've been in different places in the country, going to the conferences and being able to speak and meet with other people. So, usually, <coughs> I wear something that has that on it, or I wear something that has a message on it. So, you know, usually, so I'm, I don't want to say that I'm promoting, but in the sense that you know, I'm not like taking any time from the business at hand, like, hey, here's practice and here are the business side as we're talking about, but just making sure that, you know, if, if nothing else, that the kids would feel comfortable approaching me at some point if they didn't want to like talk in front of their peers, like, hey, coach, you know, I'm thinking that this might be something or whatever, what have you, um, just making sure that the student felt or students feel comfortable. And I've had kids from other teams approach me and I'm just like, hey, you know, there's an organization called You Can Play and just making sure that they're aware of the resources that are available to them should they choose to get involved in sports or looking for other people who have common interests. They love sports but happen to identify as being gay. So that's something I do. Just trying to make sure, one, that the kids see me being comfortable being myself and know that they're not alone. And I mean, bigger than me, there are other people who enjoy sports at the same time, so. Right on. And mm -hmm. for me, when I was out and about running and doing the things that I did, I was kicking in doors. I was at schools. I was at um, after school programs. I was everywhere. I was at um, North, Central, Rocky. And then another thing that helped too is I always had like, um, uh, like a 20 something that went through the struggles one and two i always started with i ain't i'm here to help you i ain't trying to sleep with you right because the kids was like and then so after they had seen me once or twice then they they just it was like I, the pie piper they was just coming they were I, it was it was a overwhelming but i have a lot of people that I, um, I could call on and rely on, you know, because some kids just need to get some things off their chest. And if they can be heard, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can be steering them in the right direction. And the funny part is, so um, I'm all about higher learning now. And I shouldn't say that I was never about higher learning. It's just that I was so scared of myself. And that after I got my associate's degree, I just ran off and did something different. I was in retail and retail had me traveling all around the United States. And I thought it was cute, you know, being in different cities, living in different places. Boo. I should have got that education 100%. So I'm all about making sure that these kids have these safe spaces and have this information that's out there because it gets better. Because when mm -hmm. you get that little education and you can break up out of here, I think that's something they can't take from you. You can twitch right on across that stage, get that diploma, <laughs> and press. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. I'm, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hear you. I mean, see how many kids that I have mentored that now live in like Los Angeles, New York City, and they call me and they have me in tears because I've always been behind the scenes, the guy that don't have 30 million letters behind his name. And they tell me, Tim, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. So basically you try to be in spaces and be available to youth where appropriate so that they can have that outlet and be that safe space for them, for them to be able to 
do all, everything they need to do to be successful um, in their endeavors and also have a safe space. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. you know, go where most people won't go because a lot of people tell you what they will do, but they just don't go. And like I said, and I don't want to keep saying that, but the alphas was in the streets. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that's why I jumped on board because they mm -hmm. were places that most people weren't trying to go just because they were trying to be seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just trying to have a say. Yeah. And the, the visibility, piece, I don't work with youth very often, but the visibility piece for me is key. What Tim, both Tim and Jaren pointed to this. When you show up being who you are and being yeah. visible, you are empowering others who may, you may not even realize. Um, I, I had someone in, in the corporate space say to me, it, it'll, it'll, you're, you made it easier for the next black lesbian who looks like you. Mm -hmm. And I said, I hope so. I hope that's true. I hope I made, I hope I didn't make it harder. I hope I made it easier for, I hope Alpha's made it easier for the next group of black lesbians who walk into some space in the LGBT community and don't feel welcome. I hope we make it easier for them to say, no, we coming, whether you want us here or not, we're coming, we're gonna be a part of it. Um, I happened to um, just out and about meet a young black lesbian couple just yesterday. And one of my friends was like, hey, she just brought them to me like, like I'm like, she's like, you need to know Brandy. Here's a big sister for you. Um, and that's, it's comical, but we all, all need that when we are who we are in mm -hmm. the quad cities. We need big brother Tim. We need coach Jaren. We need big sisters, you know, people who are visible and who show us that you can do it. It's, it's, it's possible. You can be exactly who you are and you can be successful and you know we can't we can't outrun bigotry. We can't outrun prejudice. Mm -hmm. We're, we all have to deal with it and cope with it. However, you'll be okay if you're willing to take that struggle and turn it into progress. You'll yeah. be okay, and you can do it even right here in the Quad Cities. It's possible. Yeah. So I think black you guys, and gay. <laughs> so I think you guys have done a, um, like. First of all, just sharing from your personal experiences that some of which I know have been traumatic for you. Um, I just have so much love and admiration for that courage that that takes. Um, and so I, I would be remiss to not to not share that with you. Um, my intentions following this conversation is to make sure we are, are the alpha still active. First of yeah. all, yeah. I we're, wanna, we're on Facebook. You can go into the comments, um, Brandy, or I can and put the acronym in there and a resource for people who um, maybe would want to follow up related to that group. The other thing that I want to do is um, as we prepared for this conversation, um, I know that there were some elements of it for for the for some of the folks who are on this call that were a little bit triggering. And so I, I will, after this episode, go into the comments and um, put some resources if there are people who want to um, connect to additional supports to have further conversations or if they want to share resources with um, other people who may have been impacted by this conversation. So that's really important as well. The other thing is this conversation, um, well, I tell you what, um, there's so many, if y'all would have known, if you know how many more questions we actually had prepared, you know, this could be easily another two hours, but I want to be respectful of the time that you have volunteered. But I like to make sure that as we, when we tackle um, issues in our hidden conversations, it's really important for me that we end with solutions, right? That we end with some type of strategy or insight to help people be better as it relates to either being an ally or understanding the LGBTQ plus experience. And so I'm gonna ask each of you just as succinctly as possible. It, um, we're talking about um, what your experiences have been here. And I wanna know, you can answer either one, just one or the other. If you were talking to black youth or adults who may be struggling with their sexual identity or their gender identity, what advice would you give them? Or you can answer, what needs to happen in this community to make um, our community more inclusive of the LGBTQ plus folks? And where do we start? So Jaron's going first. And Tim <laughs> looks like he's going second. <laughs> and Brandy, I'll bring up the <laughs> we'll try to be as distinct as possible, um, you know, and, and, but of course, you know, we can go over it's your time, not mine. So. It's, yeah. you know, it's as simple as saying the conversations need to happen. People yeah. need to stop being afraid to talk about this um, because we have always been a part of the community. Mm 
Um, and there are people, I mean, seriously, we have always been a part of the community. We may not have been an accepted part of the community. And there are people in your families, I'm talking to the audience, um, in your families, whether you want to acknowledge that or not. And, you know, if you are in any way loving, you need to understand that the silence is dangerous. And, and Brandy mentioned that earlier. So the conversations need to happen. You know, it can be a one-time thing. It needs to be ongoing. And, you know, it's not about recruiting because the people who are ignorant probably think that's what it's about. But, you know, especially where youth is concerned, the, the conversations are necessary because of mental health and safety. We're talking about um, young people taking their lives because they can't talk to anybody and, and they don't feel worthy of love. They don't feel like they're enough. And, and all three of us can say that it does get better, but it would be nice if these kids didn't have to wait for that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Jaron. I really appreciate that. Tim. Well, I want to piggyback off what he said. Let's commit because this is, like I said, this is the first time this should be an ongoing conversation and we shouldn't mind going over if we're going to speak our truth and we're trying to help somebody. We shouldn't mind going over a few minutes with that. So where I want to say is um, <clears throat> we all have a common goal. And I love that you gave us this platform, Ladrina, to talk about our common goal. But let's commit to that common goal because it's one thing that, because we are three different individuals in three different platforms. And like I said, I've intersected with Brandy, so I know what was going on with her, but I'm on the Iowa side of the river, so I have these kids in Illinois. Jaren, I didn't know anything about you being an educator, and you know, and I'm not knocking that, but it's just that I don't know the people that I could actually use as resources so somebody can actually reach out and keep going doing what they're doing, because I'm telling you, some people get knocked on their head with their, um, their blackness, their gayness, their because the, the worst is going to be transgender. And I hate to say that, but you know, when they're trans, mm -hmm. I don't even understand it, but I don't down them for it. But you know, mm -hmm. people like, use a boy, boy. Mm -hmm. They're not. That's not mm -hmm. the answer. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I, I just would like to see some kind of commitment out of either a part two or, or a little more linger or um, mm -hmm. just a commitment on our end because this is a, a because I was really nervous and I feel like I'm stuttering now, but I was really nervous just to have this conversation for this important fact that I'm not in control. And I don't want to say I'm an embarrassment because I'm not an embarrassment because I, I do what I do and I do it well, well, <laughs> you know, but I'm just saying it, it just, it was, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And how am I 51 and I'm struggling, you know what I'm saying? But yet and still I'm behind the scenes helping pushing, driving other folks, and um, I'm one of the have-nots. You know what I'm saying? Make that make sense. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hear you saying you want to see more collaboration, more incorporation of voices in a sustained conversation so that the conversation doesn't end today, um, but that people are willing to dig into some of these, um, what, what I would call the way that people respond to is like a taboo conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to demystify, okay? We need to demystify those things that are right there at our fingertips and, and right there in as simple as a conversation can make things less scary. Mm -hmm. And um, How do we get from HBO after dark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see what I'm saying? Hidden yeah. conversation yeah. after dark. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I can I can definitely appreciate that. And then Brandy, which question were you going to tackle, and and what do you what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm probably going to mismatch them both. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. um, but let's unhide these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, black people, any people, minority groups. I know a lot of minority groups have these same issues. Let's unhide these conversations. Keeping these conversations hidden are costing us lives. It's costing us our young people. We're sending our young people out into the lion's den with no education about their bodies and about their sexuality and about how to have healthy relationships, whatever your sexuality is. Um, let's let's unhide these conversations first. So thank you, Dr. Ladrina, for being a part of that. Um, second of all, when, <clears throat> when it comes to allyship, again, I struggle with that word a lot because- 
Somebody turned some on Facebook. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was getting some feedback, but no, maybe you're I, good. Am, you're I, good now. am I good? Okay. So um, when it comes to allyship, um, those of us who would like to be allies and would like to think of themselves as allies and be active allies to, to us, um, you cannot be silent and be an ally. You cannot be passive and be an ally. It's not enough just for you yourself, just like we say when, when we're talking about um, racism it's not enough just you know to be anti-racist you have to you have to t have to then take that further you know it's not enough um that you don't like how lgbt people are treated you have to then be a voice yourself even if you're not a part of our community um you know i'm sure i'm sure in all the work that any of the three of us do when there are non-lgbt people involved that that work gets amplified so um here in the Quad Cities or anywhere else you are, you, you're going to have to um, be an active participant in mm -hmm. the things that you see, even when it's going to cause you some friends or even when it's going to upset the pastor or even when it's going to um, not be the popular thing in the locker room. You're going to have to speak up as much as we do because, hell, they know we're gay. We're out here. Hey. We're out here. I, I, want, I, want the people to, I want people who aren't gay to start speaking up. I want... You know, all the people who, who love me, you know, behind closed doors, I want them to speak up about it in public. You know, so that just like racism, that's what it that's what it takes to really start chipping away at, um, you know, the anti-gay sentiment that still exists. So I think I matched those questions up. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of stop there with it. And ditto to everything Jaron and Tim said perfectly. Ditto to all of that. Yeah. So. Uh, the next steps for us, I think, um, you know, going into this conversation, um, one thing that we we've kind of put we've lumped some things together that could maybe be separate issues. And so I would look for guidance mm -hmm. on you all in, in terms of input. And because I think we really haven't had a chance to delve into gender. Um, and I recognize that we also don't have trans representation here. So I don't know that it would necessarily be appropriate. Um, because I, I don't want to um, speak on anyone's behalf or <laughs> not give people a platform who are deserving. Yes. Um, and so we'll have to navigate what that is. Um, but there's definitely some complexities uh, to this conversation. There's a number of things that we didn't touch on, um, specifically like the back, Black Lives Matter and the intersectionality of the Black Lives Matter, uh, the, that, 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 uh, that group and the LGBTQ plus community. Um, some other things that I think are really important for us to do some digging into or for people who are listening to do some digging in on their own um, would also be looking at like some of those disparities um, in, in outcomes for people who, who have the LGBTQ plus identity and are black. But furthermore, and I can't underscore this um, in terms of thematic in our conversation is to the black community, to the black community who, and, and considering those folks who are LGBTQ, it is hardest, what I hear, what I've heard you all say is it is hardest on us in our own community. And so we need other black folks who are embracing black folks and embracing people from the LGBTQ plus community. Charity starts at home. And if we can't find a sense of community where we have a shared identity with people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's an impossible place to be. Mm -hmm. And so I hope from this conversation that um, people of all walks of life, of life but especially um, Black folks can connect to some of these experiences that you have had to pave the way. It's already hard enough just being Black. And we shouldn't make this experience harder on anyone else um, in our community. And so with that, I will thank you again for your time. We're going to go backstage, carry the conversation <laughs> on a little bit. Y'all going to miss out if you're listening. Um, but we will see you all again to our listeners. We'll see you next month for our hidden conversation. We're going to have some various uh, authors who will be represented in, and talk about Black literacy and talk about um, the experience of authorship. And so thank you, Jaron. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Brandy. And we will see the rest of you all next month. Take care now. Thank you for joining us this evening for Hidden Conversations. The Hidden Conversations project is coordinated by Dr. Ladrina Wilson, Tracy Singleton, Dr. Lauren Hammond Ford, Ryan Sadler, and me, Jared Johnson. We would also like to thank everyone on the Intelligent Conversations Planning Committee 
and on WVIK's Community Advisory Board for their support and guidance. Support for tonight's conversation comes from a Healing Illinois grant from the Chicago Community Trust, as well as a United for Equity grant from United Way Quad Cities. And mark your calendars for March 10th, 2022, when Michelle Norris, longtime host of NPR's All Things Considered, Washington Post contributor, and author of The Grace of Silence, will keynote our live Intelligent Conversation event, made possible by the Joyce and Tony Singh Family Foundation.